Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Metallurgy for the Rest of Us, a brief and non-exhaustive look at ferrous metallurgy for craftsmen and other non-metallurgist types. Today we're going to look at the question, what is steel? And the brief answer is, steel is iron, chemical symbol Fe, plus carbon, chemical symbol C. So all steels, no matter whether it's a tool steel, alloy steel, or stainless steel, has at least these two elements, iron and carbon. Now the vast majority of a steel composition is iron. That is the main um, ingredient. And the carbon is only a very small um, percentage, less than 2% carbon content in steel, all the way down to just a trace of 0.05%. That's all steel is, iron plus carbon. Now we'll look at several different um, differentiations of steel. First off, we'll look at a classification called carbon steel. Now, this seems really redundant, and it is, because by definition, steel is iron plus carbon. But for the sake of um, breaking it down into other categories as well, steel that has mainly carbon as the alloying element is referred to as carbon steel. We divide carbon steels into three basic categories according to carbon content. We've got low carbon, also known as mild steel, which has from just a trace of 0.05% up to 0.35% carbon content. Then we have medium carbon steels. The uh, medium carbon range will go from 0.35% up to 1.5% carbon. Medium carbon steel is going to be a lot tougher than your low carbon or mild steel, but it won't really be quite as, as hard and strong as your higher carbon steels. A high carbon steel is classified as above 0.5%. And most of your high, highest carbon steels won't go much beyond 1% carbon. The more carbon, the higher the carbon content, the harder and stronger and more brittle that steel can become. And so the exact uh, recipe is adjusted depending on the use for that steel. Our next category of steels we'll look at are alloy steels. And again, by definition, if it's a steel, it is iron plus carbon. But the alloy steels have a variety of other alloying elements as well, things like chromium, lead, nickel, silicon, molybdenum, vanadium, tungsten, manganese, and there's others like cobalt that you'll see in different alloy steels. Now, these alloying elements add different properties to the steel, properties such as increased, increased toughness, um, increased hardenability, makes it easier to harden. You get uh, deeper through hardening. Lead added to steel makes it more easy to machine. So a, um, a low carbon leaded steel will turn on a lathe or machine on a milling machine really smooth and really fast. They call it free cutting steel. Chromium will add to the corrosion resistance of steel and nickel will add toughness. Ah, here's a term that gets thrown around a lot and there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Spring steel. So spring steel is a category of steel, generally a high carbon, that can be hardened and then tempered to be very tough and springy. So the applications for a spring steel would obviously be any types of springs, leaf springs, coil springs, clock springs, to uh, pry bars, crowbars, uh, different types of tools, chisels, and things like uh, gear shift levers, anything that needs to be tough and springy. And spring steel is not really a classification with a numbering system of its own. Spring steels can be plain high carbon steels. Spring steels can be different types of alloy steels. It's more of a, class, a general classification by use. We use 5160 high carbon spring steel for many of our draw knives, chisels, 
and things like that. Structural steel, this is the I-beams, the channel, angle iron, things like that. Structural steel is a uh, generally in the alloy steel uh, classification, and you'll find both low alloy structural steel and quench and temper structural steels, which are a higher carbon version that have been hardened and tempered for greater strength. These structural steels are designated with the um, um, ASTM International numbering system, which we talk about in our video, uh, Steel Numbering Systems Part 2. Next, we will look at tool steel. Now, tool steels are made in smaller quantities. They are made to much tighter, um, tight, more tight uh, quality control and a tighter recipe control and are used for a variety of special, special purposes. Tool steels are designated by a letter for the category and then a number for the specific steels. So the different letters of tool steels would be W for water hardening, O for oil hardening, A for air hardening, so far so good, D. Now the D series tool steels can be either oil or air hardening and they are a, an abrasion resistance, resistant steel. S are shock steels. H are high temperature steels. We use H13 for our punches and our drifts where we're punching and drifting the eyes of axes and adzes. It stands up to very high temperatures before it softens. Next we have the M and the T series of high speed steel. These steels were designed for high speed cutting on lathes and milling machines. The M series, like the popular M2, as molybdenum as the main alloying element, and the T-series uses tungsten. The L-series and F-series are special purpose, and P is a mold steel specifically for doing casting molds like injection plastic molds. Stainless steel. This is one that's common, folks are familiar with. Stainless steel. So this, once again, is steel plus high levels of chromium and sometimes nickel. Like I mentioned before, chromium adds to the corrosion resistance of the steel. And when you have enough of it present, it makes a stainless steel that will, is highly resistant to corrosion from water, from other types of chemicals. So you'll find stainless steels used in marine applications around water. You'll find it in food service where a high degree of polish and cleanliness is necessary. And you'll see high carbon stainless steels used in cutlery, particularly kitchen cutlery. Cast iron. Now, cast iron is not steel, but it is in the iron and steel family, and it bears looking at. Cast iron actually is a very, very high carbon uh, product, where steel will have from a trace of carbon up to maybe um, point two, uh, less than 0.2% carbon. Cast iron is going to have above 2% and up to 6% carbon. Think about it this way. You know how you put sugar in, in your tea or in your water and you stir it up and you add a little sugar and you stir it up and it dissolves in the water, right? You add some more, it keeps dissolving. There comes a point where it will dissolve no more sugar and the excess sugar remains undissolved and, and just precipitates out and falls down into the bottom of your cup. So that's what's happening with cast iron. It has such a high carbon content that that extra carbon precipitates out of solution and is in little flakes or nodules scattered throughout the material. Now what this does is it creates a material that is extremely strong, extremely hard, but brittle. But cast iron has tremendous compressive strength. That's why cast iron is used for machinery bases. All of my uh, power hammers and my antique machinery have cast iron frames and bases. Very poor in tensile strength, like a pulling apart strength or a bending strength is very brittle, but in compression it is incredibly strong. There's several different types of cast iron. We'll look at four of them briefly. There's gray cast iron, which is your most common type. Very strong, but very brittle. Uh, very easy to break, but the common 
use would be any type of old cast iron things like radiators and machinery bases and that sort of thing. White cast iron is an even higher carbon and higher strength used for certain special purposes like rock crushing equipment. Then we have malleable and ductile cast irons. These are, have much greater tensile strength and bending strength and are used for applications where, where a little more um, give is needed. A lot of the anvils and swage blocks being cast today are cast out of a ductile iron and work really, really well. Last of all, we'll take a look at wrought iron. You've probably all heard the term wrought iron, and it is a material that has not been commercially produced since probably the 1960s. But in the 17 and 1800s, this was the main uh, form in which iron came. It had almost no carbon. It was relatively soft and easy to work. And because of its nature of manufacture, it had a, a silica-based slag worked into the material and spread dispersed throughout it, giving it an almost wood-like grain. Today, the um, only sources of wrought iron are scrap and recycled sources. Wrought iron is highly prized by blacksmiths doing restoration and historical work. One of the great benefits of wrought iron was that because of that, uh, that slag in the, um, in the material, it was very highly corrosion resistant. So your wrought iron ship hulls, your wrought iron railings and exterior ironwork were very highly resistant to rust and corrosion. So there you have it, the short answer to what is steel. I hope you found this useful. For more information, check out my part one and part two of the steel numbering systems. And stay tuned for our next video in the series coming soon.